Okay, let's talk about some more specific aspects of 12-tone serialism. Um, okay, to compose a piece in 12-tone serialism, the first step is to compose a 12-tone row from which we would get 48 row forms, four permutations, 12 transpositions of each of those permutation. Now let's demonstrate this briefly. And I'm actually going to make, this is not going to be a 12-tone row, this is going to be like a 4-tone row. Okay, but just imagine it was 12 tones. Just for the interest of time, so that you're not sitting here watching me do this forever, let's do it with 4 tones. And actually, let's do Bach. Now, in German, the B is actually B-flat. So let's do B... A, C, and then H in German is actually B natural. Okay, there's a four-tone row. Now, again, imagine we're stretching this. We're going to have 12 of these, but we're just going to do four for simplicity's sake right now. Now, how that is the P0. Okay, now what is the... The first thing we want to do is the I0. The I0 is going to start on B flat because by calling this P0 that means that B flat is now 0. Okay? B flat is 0. Let me show you here. B flat 0, B natural is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 1. I mean 0. Sorry, 12 equals 0. So there are only 12 pitch classes. We assign a number to each of them. This could be unique for each piece. Although some theorists always make C0, but we're not going to do that in this class. Okay, so coming back to our little thing here. B-A-C-H, that's my four-tone row, not 12-tone row. I'm going to start, if I have an I0, it's going to start on B-flat because with I's, the subscript number indicates the first uh, pitch class of that series. And then I'm going to reverse the intervals. This one goes down a semitone. I'm going to go up a semitone. Okay, this one goes up a minor third. I'm going to go down a minor third. Or you could think of it in terms of the relationship with the first note. Uh, this is a whole step up from B flat, so I go down a whole step down, anyway, A flat or G sharp, it does not matter. Spellings do not matter. Um, and then this one goes down a semitone, so we'll go up a semitone. Boom, there's your I0, P0, I0. We also have our R0, which is R0 goes that way. Okay, so the R0 is B. C, A, E flat, and then our R, I, 0, A, A flat, B, B flat. Our first, our first four permutations, first four row forms. Um, now, another step to this process, and let me see if I can do this might be able to do this, is making what we call a matrix or a magic square. And this is kind of fun, and it, it is a way of getting every single row form represented in a, a nice, tidy space. Well, it's not so tidy when you have a 12-tone row instead of a, a uh, four-tone row. Let's get a little more light on our playing surface here uh, from the sun. I always prefer natural light. There we go. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to put our P0 across the top. Now, we could use numbers, in, in which case we go 0, 11, 2, 1. We're not going to do that. We're going to go B flat, A, C, B natural. And then down, so that's across 
down is going to be the inversion, I0. B flat, we've already got our B flat. B natural here, A flat, and A natural. We don't have to put in the natural signs. Now, this is the start of our matrix. Now, all we have to do is, because this is P0 here, and this is I0, this is going to be R0 going that way, and this is going to be, ran out of space, RI0 going that way. We can also represent, at least, uh, again, if this were a 12-tone row, we could represent all 48 row forms. We're not going to represent that many here. What is this going to be? 4 times 4, um, 16. But at any rate, there are several ways we could go about doing this. One way is we could say, okay, I'm going to do these across because if this is the P0, the next one starting on B, well, B is 1. If B flat is B, B natural is 1, and then A flat is going to be, actually be 10, and a natural is going to be 11. Um, it's getting a little messy here, but this will be the P1. This will be the P10 and then P11. This is going to be the I11. And this will be the I2. C is 2. The I1. Okay. So I could either do this one, this one, this one, or I could do this one, this one, this one. It doesn't matter. P1, that means every single one of these notes is going to be transposed up by one semitone. So I could go, okay, once one semitone up from A, that would be B flat. One semitone up from C is C sharp. One semitone up from B is C natural. And uh, in this case, we could either compare these adjacent ones and say, oh, B flat to A flat, I mean B natural to A flat, that's down three semitones, that's one way to think about it. Or you could say, oh, well, the, the relationship here to B flat is down two semitones, so you could compare these. But I'm going to go, I'm going to, I mean, I'm going to add nine semitones which is the same thing as going down by a minor third of three semitones. B down to A flat. B flat down three semitones. G, C sharp down three semitones. Okay, B flat, C down three semitones is A. So there's our P10 and then our P11. I'm just gonna go up one semitone from the P10. G sharp, B natural, B flat, there. That is your, you know, magic square. And of course, we could we could identify these. This is the R1, the R10, and the R11. This is the RI11, RI2, um, RI1. Uh, Again, the first note of the the prime and the inversion tells identifies that number. The last note of the retrograde, in other words, R0 goes this way, so the last note, B-flat, gives us that zero. Same thing with the Ri's. So this is how you get all these 48 row forms. And let's uh, do a little work. Now, one thing you can also do that's very helpful, like on a test or whatever, is, I used to do this all the time, you make yourself a keyboard like this. Like that, and then, you know, counting, you know, when we say, oh, this next one's three semitones down, well, you go one, two, three, Etc. You can, it makes it a lot easier. I use those things all the time. Now let's do a, a little bit of this homework. And um, I'll get a pencil for this. 
Okay, so if, let's start with the first one. If we're given I6, then we have to come up with P0. Well, this is not too hard. The main thing is to come up with the first note of this row form. What does this 6 represent? Well, that represents um, F sharp. So F sharp is 6. If F sharp is 6, let's go over here to the piano. If F sharp is 6, then what's 0? Well, let's count down. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. So C is 0 for this particular situation. Um, and then this wants us to start with 0 because P's and I's always start with that number, with that pitch class. Um, R's and RI's always end with that, okay? So this needs to start with a C. Let's put it up here, maybe. It doesn't matter. These are pitch classes, not pitches. Now, because we're going from I to P, it's the same as going from P to I, we're going to reverse the intervals. In other words, we're going to give their complements. So instead of going up one semitone, we're going to go down one semitone. Or you could think of it as going up 11 semitones. You know, 12 minus 1 is 11. But I'm going to go down one semitone. Again, because we're going from I to P, these are inversions of each other. Um, what is that? Transitive property where, you know, we perform the same operation twice. It reverses the original... Uh, Outcome? I don't know. Anyway, up, perfect fourth, down, and perfect fourth. Okay. Down, four semitones, basically a major third or diminished fourth. Let's go up by that much. Four semitones to B flat. And then this one goes up a perfect fourth. Let's go down a perfect fourth. I'm not going to bother with naturals. I mean, just to let you know. And then this one goes up a minor second. Let's go down a minor second, etc. Okay, that's how you would do that one. Let us do a somewhat more difficult. These all involve P zeros. Okay, well, let's just do. Uh, yeah, let's do the next one. Okay, here we have the R I two. Okay, so first thing we want to do is we need to, this is a P0, we have to start with 0. Well, which note is 0? Well, the 2 here, because it's an RI, that 2 represents the last note of the row form. So this is 2. So if B flat equals 2, then what is 0 going to be? Well, let's look at our piano here. B flat equals 2. One zero zero is a flat or G sharp, however you want to call it. Okay, so so that means we need to start with a flat here. We know that's the first note. Now it gets a little bit tricky. We want to follow the interval order because this is a retrograde from the end to the beginning, and from the beginning to the end. But we also, because that's the retrograde part, but we also reverse the direction of the interval. So we're going to do two different operations, okay? Now, so we started out by finding the this guy, and then we, we go from there. Okay, so let's, we'll count from here, and then we'll, Put it here. This one goes up three semitones or minor third essentially. Let's go down a minor third. Okay, then this one goes down a minor second. Let's go up a minor second. This one goes down a minor third. Let's go up a minor third. This goes down a minor second. Let's go up a minor second etc. Okay? 
So that's how we would do that. Now this one, similar thing. We need to find the RI7 from the uh, from the P0. So we know that F sharp is zero. Um, that means that seven is going to be seven semitones or a perfect fifth up from F sharp. F sharp, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So C sharp or D flat. Okay, but because this is a retrograde, that seven is the last note. The B flat is actually, or C sharp, I'm sorry, is actually the last note. So let's actually, we'll write down the notes from the end to the beginning. So, but we have to do this. Okay, it's inverted and a retrograde. So we have to start from here to get the retrograde, and we have to reverse the order of the intervals to get the inversion. This one goes up four semitones. Let's go down four semitones. This one goes up two semitones. Let's go down two semitones. This goes up one semitone. Let's go down one semitone. It keeps going up. This one goes down two semitones. Let's go up two semitones, etc. until you get to the beginning. So that's how we do that. Get started. Excuse me. Uh, I mean, we're continuing, sorry. Second half of this lecture. I want to talk a little bit about, uh, just give you some examples of the earliest 12-tone music. Of course, there were proto 12-tone uh, methods or musics. Most interesting to my mind is, I told you that Charles Ives preceded pretty much every technique that we'll learn this semester. He did anticipate uh, 12-tone music. He wrote a series of pieces called Tone Roads, R-O-A-D-S, that have some similarities with uh, Schoenberg's 12-tone series. Maybe someday one of you will go out and prove that it, uh, Schoenberg ripped it off from Charles Ives. Who knows? Um, you know, America, the land of innovation and everything. Um, but uh, also a um, Swiss composer named Hauer, H-A-U-E-R, uh, did quasi-12-tone music before Schoenberg's 12-tone method. I think Schoenberg even references that composer. And some non-12-tone serialism in music by uh, Scriabin and even earlier composers, you know, that, that really, it's not atonal, but it's serial in nature. Anyway, well, let's look at a little bit at some of the movements of the um, of the uh, suite. Uh, let's see what we got here. Okay, so here's the um, here's a what we would call a twelve count of Schoenberg's Prelude from the Suite Opus Twenty Five. And let me see if I also have. What do I have here? Ah, here is, here's the matrix for, um, let me just see what I've got here. Ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum. Ah, good. Okay, let's see if we can get a little view here that will help us. Let's fit one page and then page display, two page view. There we go, isn't this exciting? Okay, so again, first piece that was completely serial from beginning to end by Schoenberg. Now, if you, you some of you may be familiar with the Baroque suite, composed, uh, we're especially familiar with those by Bach, but also Handel, the Alamand, the Courant, the Saraband, and the Giga. These are modeled in the Baroque period um, after sets of pieces that were used for dances, actually, that, that, you know, if you went to a dance, um, you know, and if you were kind of upper class, you would learn how to do these different dances. Most of them were kind of like square dances. In other words, you would have a principal partner, but you'd kind of rotate between partners. And um, um, 
So if you've ever seen Pride and Prejudice, you'll, you, there are lots of scenes where of this type of dancing. And uh, the evening would proceed from in a familiar order. So the Alamand, the Courant, the Saraband, and the Giga were the standard dances. Other dances could be inserted between those. So now the dance suites of, of Bach probably were not designed to be using used for dancing. They were a little too complicated. Uh, it was more like this form had spun off into a, a more of a uh, separate art form. Um, and then uh, this uh, suite um, of Schoenberg's was really, um, we would call it neoclassicism, you know, hearkening back to an earlier era. But of course, this piece bears only a little bit of resemblance to the uh, original form, the gavotte. You may be familiar with other gavottes. It's a unique um, uh, form in that it's always starts, it's always in cut time. It starts on the second beat and the emphasis is actually on the second beat. You may know the That's a gavotte by Bach for cello solo. Anyway, um, let's listen to this. If we can, let's pull it up. Um, blah, 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 blah. Wait, is that the, yeah, that's the gavotte. Sorry, let me pull it up. I thought I had it pulled up, but let's see. Schoenberg. Gavotte. This should work. I just love YouTube. I can't get enough of it. Okay. We'll play it and then we'll look at the analysis. Come on. Well, maybe not. Here we go. So, so it's kind of a fun piece. It's got a really fun rhythm. Um, you know, actually, you could really imagine dancing to this, although it, it might not be, it might be sort of a demented form of the Baroque dance, you know. I guess you could imagine a demented version of the powdered wigs and those sort of silken clothes with the stockings and knickers that they used to wear and the fancy shoes. Anyway, let's not worry about that. But we're concerned with, um, and again, but I, I will say this idea of neoclassicism really goes along with this, this method, you know, that Schoenberg moved away from this hyper romanticism into this more uh, sort of emotionally restrained and more um, kinetic kind of music with simpler, uh, more periodic rhythms for sure. This goes along with the move toward the 12 tone method and it's part of a, a broader uh, movement of neoclassicism after the First World War. We, we looked at, you know, a lot of the music that we looked at in the previous unit uh, post-Impressionism was also in this mode of neoclassicism, but with very different, um, uh, very different uh, techniques. Anyway, Okay, so what's happening here? Well, this is basically first order serialism. We got one row form at a time, and I've got my matrix here that I showed you how to look at. You'll notice that uh, we this doesn't necessarily have to happen. This is not the first movement, um, and but we just happen to have the P zero at the beginning, um, and. You can see here E, there's our E, 
F, F, G, G, D flat, or C sharp, doesn't matter. And then um, G flat or F sharp, number five. And we number these. Uh, these are the order numbers, not the pitch class numbers. Five, six, seven, eight, etc. going along here. Now, you'll notice something a little bit strange happening, which is that the left hand is, this is kind of like on a typewriter with the carriage return. We go from 1 to 8, then we go to 9 here, 10, 11, 12. This does not follow the rules. You are correct, mesdames and messieurs. This breaks the rules. And not only that, we go 9, 10, 11, 12, and then we go backwards, 11, 10, 9. So right from the start, Schoenberg was stretching these rules a little bit. Um, but it enables him to create a, an accompaniment or, or a counter melody. This is really contrapuntal that, that doesn't involve any octaves, which is really important to him uh, because he felt that octaves would create a, a false sense of tonality. Then we have the next passage, which is another row form, I6, which is right here, B flat, A, G, G C sharp, etc. B flat, A, G, uh, C sharp or D flat, uh, five, six, seven, eight. And then same thing again. We go back here for the nine, 10, 11, 12, 11, 10, nine. So he does the same kind of thing. Now, then it gets even weirder. Here we have the P6, which is going to be right here. A sharp or B flat, B, C sharp, G, etc. And here we go. B flat. Where's the B? Right here, B. And where's the C sharp? C sharp or D flat here. So one, two, three. Where's the four? Uh, four. <laughs> and then we go back here. Five, six, seven, eight. And then nine, 10, 11, 12. So this is kind of like he's got, what, three different voices happening at the same time. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, blah, blah, blah. That's, again, not according to classic rules of serialism. But, um, well, you could look at it several ways. Um, Schoenberg got a little more strict after this piece, after this first piece. And so he was, you know, testing out the rules. I think maybe he thought, OK, this was kind of fun to stretch the rules. But why have these rules if you're going to stretch them all the time? Maybe you don't even need these rules. Um, of course, nobody except for, you know, him and nerds like us even know that this is happening. So it's, it, there's, it's not a question of integrity or, um, but, you know, this idea of comprehensibility of making the music make more sense or sound like it makes more sense. I think he maybe felt like it depended on, on following this. Let's look at the uh, prelude, which uses the same... Uh, of course, this is the very beginning. It uses the same uh, 12-tone row and thus the same row form, same um, uh, matrix we could use. And let's listen to a little of that, actually. Uh, yeah, here we go. the the rhythmic uh, aspect of this this is actually I wanted to play this for you this is the giga from the suite played by Glenn Gould unfortunately we don't have the um, video but oh wow this thing rocks like crazy listen to this Okay, 
So that's kind of fun. Anyway, back to the prelude. Let's look at the 12 count of that. Um, here we have the P0. This is second order serialism. So we have the P0 here. And you can check this E, F, G, D flat. Let's look at our thing here. E, F, G, D flat. Uh, you know, G, uh, E flat, A flat, D. Uh, e flat, A flat, D. Of course, these are sharps, not flats. It doesn't matter. Etc. Back down to this B flat. Then it's accompanied by the P6. So P0 accompanied by P6 uh, in close succession. So uh, you can kind of see it has a little bit of a of a canonic, but you know, like a round or a cannon, not quite. But um, now you'll notice that the P zero uh, is you know this is normal, correct? The the P six here he's going to this thing that he did in the later movement. Those, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then he goes back, nine, 10, 11, 12, the carriage return. So you kind of see that happening. Now I've put these counts in parentheses because I just want to point out to you that some theorists, I may have mentioned this earlier, always assign zero to C. And that means that even though this is the very first row form in the piece, which is where we usually get our P0 from, if we were using zero, I mean C is zero, fixed O, then it wouldn't be P0, it would be P4, because E is four semitones above C, etc. So, you know, there might be two different ways to describe, you know, to label the row forms. I mean, potentially there'd be even more than that, but we're going to choose the simplest one. Okay, let's look at one more piece. This is the uh, Woodwind Quintet. Let's shrink this a little bit. And um, let's listen to a little of this. I believe I have this pulled up somewhere. So here it is. The Woodwind Quintet. Now, there's, you know, there's not a lot of Woodwind Quintets by, you know, composers that are familiar to everybody, but this is one of the, one of them. And I think this is a piece that really, um, where, you know, 12 tone chromatic atonal music actually works quite well. Well, it works well in other contexts, but these sounds um, seem to really shine in this particular um, type of ensemble. I think partially because, of course, woodwind instruments are very good at nailing pitches you know, without too much difficulty. String players, singers they get messed up a little bit because they don't have a one button for every or one fingering for every pitch which you do have to a more of an extent with woodwind instruments certainly so they tend to have a easier time saying okay i'll pay, play this pitch no matter what see what happens and then also i think because uh 12 tone serialism it, it kind of results a little bit in a in a uh, tonal sameness um, and a coloristic kind of grayness or beigeness is one way to look at it. Maybe it's a different color. And having this, you know, ludicrously uh, heterogeneous color palette in the woodwind quintet uh, counteracts that. But anyway, that's my theory. Let's listen to a little of this and we'll quickly look at the 12 count. briefly to point out that uh, the person who posted this has given a an analysis that's basically using sonata form to analyze this movement and this points out that 
um, traditional tonal forms were superimposed on top of the the twelve tone method. You know, Schoenberg didn't consider the twelve tone method to replace like sonata form or rondo or ternary or binary, etc. He and, and he said that the you know a twelve tone row is not a theme. You have to make themes using the the twelve tone row. Anyway, continue. <laughs> see really nice transparent writing course uh, with a with a woodwind quintet you you don't want to have tooties very often you want to have lots of different combinations of the instruments okay let's look at the 12 count of this at least of the beginning um, and see what it reveals so um, here's our here's our matrix and uh, E flat, let's see what we got here. P0, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. However, again, this row form folds in on itself in interesting ways. Look, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And then seven, eight. So he's reversed the hexachords. He's starting with seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve here, and then he goes to one, two, three. Now you can kind of see Schoenberg's struggle here because combining, putting the same row form in two different places at the same time is going to result in octaves. So he says, "Well, I'll just reverse the hexachords, and then we won't have that problem." Now later he came up with a method called hexachordal combinatoriality which essentially means that a uh, two row forms of the same row have mutually exclusive first and second hexachords. In other words, the pitch classes in the first hexachord of one row form are completely different from the pitch classes in the first hexachord of the other row form. So you get the same effect. Um, anyway, and then you can kind of see this little thing that we saw earlier. We've got these these chords and then it's in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Um, again, irregular, non-normative, but in this, this is again an early um, opus 26, an early 12 tone piece where I think he was being a little bit free in some ways. And then he got more strict, then he got super free toward the end of his life and sort of combined 12 tone serialism with tonality and other other things. Okay, well, this is a little taste of um, of uh, twelve counting and the way that Schoenberg used twelve tone serialism in his early music. <laughs>